everyone, I'm Catherine from the Ridgefield Historical Society. Today, I'm delighted to welcome Marjorie Adams, who will give a presentation on her great-grandfather, Doc Adams, a founding father of baseball who lived in Ridgefield. Hi, Marjorie. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you, Catherine. It's very nice of you to have me. Our pleasure. I'm going to take myself out now and um, I will uh, let Marjorie share her screen. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I thank the Ridgefield Historical Society for giving me this opportunity to introduce you to my great grandfather, Dr. Daniel Lucius Adams, who lived in Ridgefield from 1865 to 1888. He was born in Mount Vernon, New Hampshire in 1814. His father was a doctor and a farmer, a state legislature, a deacon of his church, president of the New Hampshire Medical Society, a frequent orator in support of the abolitionist and temperance movements. And if that wasn't enough, he also authored one of the first arithmetic textbooks that was used in this country. And Doc was the second of their three surviving children. Among all the family papers, and we have quite a lot, this is the only one that references sports of any kind. It is a letter written to Doc by his sister Nancy in 1832. Doc was at Amherst at the time, and it was at Amherst that he first found an interest in athletics. It was also at, at Amherst that he made the, uh, the acquaintance of Henry Ward Beecher. He, he was a year ahead of Doc at Amherst, and they used to play flute duets. Henry Ward Beecher was, would become the famous abolitionist, and he was also the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. As you can see from the letter, Doc has left his bat and ball with his sister Nancy for her to play with, and she can't find it since he went away. So it shows that at an early age, Doc had an interest in bat and ball games. And of course, there were many variations in New England. So we don't know specifically what sort of bat and ball game he was playing, but it shows an early interest. Doc was at Amherst for two years and he wasn't happy there. So he transferred to Yale from where he graduated in 1835. After Yale, he went on to Harvard Medical School for two years. These are some of his class cards. We have more. And he graduated from Harvard in 1838. He then went on and studied medicine or practiced medicine with his father in Mount Vernon. But by 1839, he was living in New York City. In 1839, for the, for the sum of $400 a year, he got a job as a vaccine physician for the city of New York. He started his own medical practice, and he also volunteered as an attending physician to the New York dispensary for the poor. It was also in 1839 that he began to play baseball with the New York Baseball Club. This is the most interesting those of you with a real interest in history, I think you will appreciate it. This letter is from Doc's father to Doc in March of 1845. And if you can all see it clearly, you can see that it's obvious that Doc was offered some sort of position in Springfield, Massachusetts. We don't know what sort of job he was offered because the letters leading up to this one are missing. But it is clear that this move out of New York was contemplated and the father approved that Doc had decided not to do it and to stay in New York and stay with his own practice. This letter is interesting because later that year, just about nine months later, Doc would join the Knickerbocker Baseball Club. This was an established club that had been playing already for a few years, but they formally organized in September of 20, 23rd of 1845, just six months after that letter was written and Doc joined about a month later. In May of 1846, he was elected in vice president of the club, and the following month, he played in their first official game, 
quote unquote, in Hoboken, New Jersey. The club had used three different playing fields in Manhattan up till 1845. One of them was Madison Square Park, which still exists today, although of course it's much smaller. But because of the coming of the railroad out of New York City, the club had to leave Madison Square Park and they went, they moved their, their games to the Elysian Fields in Hoboken, New Jersey. What you see here on the screen is the scorecard from that June 19 game. Doc made three outs. What's also fun about this, at the top of the card for, under the New York club, a man made, named Davis was fined six cents for swearing. It's important to know that this was a gentleman's game. This was just men getting together for fun and exercise. It was not terribly competitive. And when the Knickerbockers were founded in 1845, they wrote, wrote down their rules. There were 17 of them. And they played 42 paces between the bases and 15 paces from pitcher's base to home. And there were seven rules that dictated how the club members were to behave because this was very much a gentleman's club. In terms of other rules of play, it was an underhand pitch. The ball was fed to the batter and there were no gloves and no cleats. They wore whatever they wore coming over on the ferry from Manhattan and going to the Elysian Fields. What you're seeing here is an interview Doc did in 1895. It appeared in several newspapers in the Midwest in 1895, and then the entire interview was published the following year in Sporting News. It is the only known firsthand account of Doc's memories of the game. And it really is this document more than anything that we really know what, he, what his memories were and how he felt about the game. The early years from 1845 to 1850 were the hardest for the club. It, they really, after they played the game with the New York club in June of 1846, they did not play another game next to another, against another, another club for another five years. And it was very difficult to keep the enthusiasm going. And as you can see here, Doc said, during these first five years, baseball had a desperate struggle for existence. And he described it as the pursuit of pleasure under difficulties. 1846, Doc was elected vice president of the club. And the following year, he was elected captain or president of the club, a position he would hold six more times over the next 17 years. And as captain, especially in those early days, it fell to Doc to encourage attendance by the players because often he would make the effort to get to the Elysian Fields and there would only be two or three other men there. And that was very discouraging. And so Doc was the one who at all the club meetings and all the club dinners had to, as he says here, induce attendance. And as he says, and he often thought it useless to continue the effort, but my love of the game led me to persevere. Back in New York in the 1840s, there was nobody making commercial balls and bats. Doc made all the balls for the club from about 1846 up until about 1861. A saddler in Lower Manhattan Island showed him how to wind the yarn around a core of rubber cuttings. He would use his friend's leftover rubber galoshes and then wrap the yarn and then wrap the leather and sew it. And what you're seeing here is um, a replica of the sort of ball that Doc Adams would make. He also had to get someone to make the bats. And he went to the various furniture turners on Manhattan and he would supervise them turning the wood. He would select the wood and then he would supervise them turning the wood until it got to the right length and taper. You really can't underplay how important this was because if Doc had not made the effort to see that the bats and balls were provided for the club, they couldn't have played anyway, even if nine people showed up or 10 people showed up. 
by 1848, and they were still playing only with themselves, they were playing enough games that there were some on-field disagreements about their own laws. So in 1848, the club formed a committee chaired by Doc to redo the laws of, of their play. And in the following year, 1849, Doc created and developed the shortstop position. The ball that Doc made was so light that you could bat it quite a distance, but you couldn't throw it very far. So one of the outfield positions, Doc took that position and moved it in closer to act as a relay from the outfield into the infield. And according to my grandfather, a little note that he left us, it was Doc's favorite position. And over his course of years of playing with the Knickerbockers, Doc played every position except pitcher. This is just for fun and I hope you all can see them. These are some of the box scores that were printed in New York newspapers of the different games because they, by 1851, there were two other clubs that the Knickerbockers could play. There were the Gothams and the Eagles. The Gothams were some of the previous members of the New York Baseball Club that had reformed as the Gothams. As an attending physician treating the poor at the New York Infirmary, Doc was often called upon to treat those suffering from the various cholera epidemics. And this is the only letter we have by Doc from this time period. And it talks about the cholera epidemic and how even the, the district attorney had died the previous week. And it's interesting how hot it was, 95 to 100, just the way it was this summer here, here in New England. By 1854, those two other clubs, the Eagles and the Gothams and the Knickerbockers were all playing lots of games against each other. But all these clubs had their own different rules of play. So a meeting was proposed for the three clubs to get together and agree on the laws by which they would play their own games. And Doc as president of the club was one of the delegates to that convention. By 1856, there were 14 clubs playing in Manhattan. And in addition, there were about a dozen other brand new clubs that were just forming. And at the club meeting, at the Knickerbocker Club meeting in December of 1856, Doc proposed that there be a general meeting of all these baseball clubs, once again, to standardize the rules of the game. So the meeting was called with all the clubs and Doc was elected the president of the convention to standardize the rules. Because Doc was president of the convention and president of the Knickerbockers, which was the most senior club in New York at the time, it fell to Doc to write the rules of baseball. And four years ago, those handwritten laws of baseball surfaced at an online auction. They had been sold in 1998 with a group of other documents. And the man who bought them loved baseball, but was really buying this other group of documents because of, of what they were, not the baseball. But in 2015, he decided to do something with these documents and had them authenticated. And they sold in April of 2016 for $3.26 million, the third, at the time, the third highest paid for any sports memorabilia, and at the time, the second highest paid for any baseball memorabilia. And what you're seeing here on the screen are the three pages of Doc's draft of the laws of baseball, which in the interview he did in 1896, he said he presented the first draft of the rules after much careful study. It is here in rule number three that Doc, who did the calculation, established the bases at 90 feet. Further along in the rules, it was also established for the first time that the duration of the game would be nine innings with nine men to a side. 
up until that point, the game was played to 21 runs and pretty much whoever showed up got to play. So the number of players on a side up till then could be anywhere from six to 11. So this was the first time it was established as nine men and nine innings. It was also here, as you can see, that Doc, Doc's calculation set the bases at 90 feet. And of course, that is still in use today. It was also the first time that the pitcher's position and distance from home plate was clearly defined. It also was the first time that revolving was outlawed, which means you couldn't jump from team to team to team. Also, betting was outlawed in, in these 1857 laws. It was also specified the size of the bat and the size of the ball. The ball that they used back then was a little bit larger than the ball that is used today and a little bit, little bit heavier. After 1857, Doc would be elected chairman of the Rules Committee for this organization that gave themselves a formal name the following year, the National Association of Baseball Players. There was one rule that was very near and dear to Doc's heart. Doc advocated for the fly game. Up until then, a, a ball caught in fair territory, either on the first bounce or on the fly, was counted as an out. And Doc thought the game would be more manly if they used exclusively the fly game. And he spoke on this subject at every single meeting of the National Association of Ball Players until he retired from the game. And the, the rule finally did pass in 1864 after Doc had left the game. One of the reasons that there was such opposition to it was there were so many young clubs and inexperienced players that they didn't know how to catch the ball properly. And there was much more risk to ha for hand injuries with the fly game. And of course, since there were no gloves, we certainly didn't want that to happen. So this was really to protect the newer, younger players. 1858 was the first all star It was a game of the best players from New York and the best players from Brooklyn. It was a series of three games. They played at a site in Brooklyn called the Fashion Race Course. And it was the first time that baseball was played in an enclosed space. And it was the first time that admission was charged. There were as many as 10,000 spectators for that first game. So the game had come a long way since 1846. Doc did not play in any of the games, but he was the umpire for the third and final game of the match. And that was held on September 10th, 1858. And that is the game ball from the actual match that is on display at the, at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. And as you can see, Doc was the umpire for the game. The next day, the New York Times covered this game extensively on the front page. I have been told that this is the first time that a baseball game was on the front page of the New York Times. I haven't, I haven't confirmed that yet, someday. This is the earliest known verified photograph of the Knickerbocker Baseball Club playing against the Excelsiors in August of 1859. And yes, that is Doc, who is pictured on the left and in fourth from the left in the group photo. Doc did play in that game. He played third base and made three outs. In March of 1862, as president, Doc sent a letter to the club meeting resigning from the Knickerbockers. I think it came as a bit of a surprise to them. I don't think that he gave them any sort of indication that he was going to resign, but it, and it took me a while to figure out why. Finally, I figured out all the family letters that Doc, who had gotten married last the previous year, 
he was he was 47 and his bride was 33 she was expecting by march of 26 of excuse me by march of 1862 she was expecting their first child and i think doc decided that being a husband and a father was now more important than this game of baseball no matter how much he loved it the letter you're seeing is in the archives at yale it's a letter that the club secretary wrote to Doc in reaction to his resignation. And I love the little postscript, playing commences on the 21st, as if to say, gee, if you change your mind, please join us. At the meeting where they, when the club received his resignation letter, they made him an honorary member of the Knickerbockers and he was proclaimed the nest door of ball players. In case your ancient Greek history is a little rusty, Nestor was an ancient king of Greece who, advi who advised the Greeks at the Battle of Troy. So the word has come down to mean a wise advisor or counselor. This is the Nestor of baseball scroll. And that is just one of the um, things written on it. The entire uh, scroll and the text is on our website, which I hope you'll visit sometime because there's a great deal more there than what I can show you here. So he said in 1861, he married Cornelia Ann Cook. And in an 1881 alumni publication for Yale, Doc wrote, my marriage was the crowning achievement of my life. This lovely brief autobiography that Doc wrote makes no mention of baseball. Well, as I said, she was expecting a child the following year, 1862, when Doc resigned. She miscarried uh, about six weeks later, and her health was so precarious that she really did not recover from this miscarriage till about September, from what I've been able to gather from the letters. They would have another child a few years later who would pass away about a month later. And that's the reason that they moved to Ridgefield, Connecticut, because it was really for Cornelia's health, because they wanted to start a family. They found a lovely property in Ridgefield that they moved to in 1865. And I love this quote from my grandfather, that one of their motives for moving to Ridgefield was for the higher altitude. And thanks to the Ridgefield Historical Society, I have these lovely images of Doc's home. Th these images that you're seeing, the house was very much added on to after Doc lived here, but I'm grateful for these images of his home in Ridgefield. It's right on the edge of Ballard Park, and I know there's a little sign there now, because I saw it there a few years ago when I had a lovely lunch with Kay Abels uh, in Ridgefield. And she pointed it out to me. And I remember as a child, my parents drove me past the house shortly before it was torn down. This is one of two British cannonballs that Doc dug out of a wall, a stone wall on his property. I have one and my sister has the other. I know that there's one in the Keeler Tavern, but this is our two British three pounders. While in Ridgefield, from 1865 to 1888, Doc became one of the founding members of the Ridgefield Library, and he was the first treasurer. He was active with the Land Improvement Association, and in 1870 served one term in the state legislature. And then in 1871, Doc became the first president of the Ridgefield Savings Bank which is today the Fairfield County Trust. And for those of you who go there, his photograph still hangs in the lobby. This also gives me an opportunity to thank the Fairfield County Bank because they've been most helpful and kind to me. Doc would serve as president for 10 of the next 15 years. And I love this Visa debit card that the Fairfield County Bank did with with Doc's name on it. I thought that was rather nice. In 1875, 
Doc received a letter from his friend, James White Davis, his former teammate, announcing a reunion game that was going to be held in Hoboken and how they hoped that Doc would be able to attend. Doc was uh, 60 years old at the time and he did attend. The game was held in Hoboken and it was the old veterans of 1855, meaning Doc and his friends, against all the newer members. They played, I think, to about three innings and then the, the fog came in and they were concerned for the health of the veteran members. So the veteran members were all hustled into carriages where, and sent off to a local tavern where they were to await everybody else who finished the game. And then they all met there and had dinner and I'm, oh, I'm sure hilarity ensued. Doc left Ridgefield in 1888. They moved to New Haven. His two sons, one of whom was my grandfather, were at Yale and it was, it was very costly for the family to have the two sons at Yale. And by moving to New Haven and having the boys living at home, not only would it save the family money, but Doc would be able to keep an eye on his sons to make sure they were studying hard enough, which I like. And this is a write-up that my grandfather, Roger Cook Adams, wrote about his father. And it shows that Doc continued his love of baseball his entire life and would play with his sons in the backyard and astonish all the boys with his battings. And he continued to make the baseballs for his sons. Then I'm going to almost close with this very nice quote from Doc from his autobiography that he did for Yale College in 1835. And again, this little autobiography, which is on our website, does not mention baseball. And it, it, it just tells you a great deal about Doc, that he didn't consider himself to be any big deal. I think considering what he accomplished in life, he was a very big deal, but I'm just a proud great granddaughter. He died January 1399. This is one of the obituaries and it does mention his, his interest in athletics and in baseball. And it also mentions his keen interest in music and those flute duets with Henry Ward Beecher. So what is next for Doc? Well, in 2014, the Society for American Baseball Research elected Doc their overlooked 19th century baseball legend. And since 2011, I have been on a mission to get Doc what I believe is his rightful recognition at the Baseball Hall of Fame. Doc did appear on the ballot in 2015. It was his first time on the ballot, the pre-integration era ballot. He got 12 votes, 75% were required for election, excuse me, he got he needed 12 votes, which is the required 25% for election. But Doc only received 10. However, he was the top vote getter on the ballot. So that was very good for a first timer. The next time he will be eligible will be this fall when the early baseball committee will meet and nominate the, the new candidates. And I am hoping that not only Doc will make the ballot, but then also will finally gain election and induction to the Hall of Fame when it is announced at the winter meetings in December this year. I want to thank the Ridgefield Historical Society for this opportunity to tell you about my great grandfather. I, I also would ask that if you believe in the mission, as I do, that you'll go on our website we have an online petition. It is absolutely private, safe, and secure. Nobody will contact you. We do not sell the names or anything like that. So please, if you believe in this mission as I do, I hope you'll sign our online petition. And once again, I want to thank the Ridgefield Historical Society for their support and again for this very nice opportunity to tell you about Doc. Thank you, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.